Christ mean is, is all about love. Love in the Bible has this amazing picture to it. Uh, as a point of comparison, you, you think of how we use that word love in English. I can say, I love my wife. I love my two girls. I love dill pickles and pizza, and maybe even dill pickles on pizza, depending on the circumstance. And by the time you walk through all of those examples, the word love is, is kind of stretched beyond what it can bear. In the Christian context, the word love, uh, as we're going to look at it here this evening, has a very specific context. This idea of love, that which reaches out and does what is best for the person that we love. And so in our gospel, we're going to hear Jesus speak about love, and especially in our sermon, there's going to be very pointed, specific uh, direct directions for love. So love, it's all about love this evening. We'll begin this evening with our opening hymn, hymn number 726, Love in Christ is Strong and Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful God, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. Merciful Father has forgiven all our sin. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you form the minds of your faithful people into a single will. Make us love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the many, many changes of this world, our hearts may ever yearn for the lasting joys of heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. 
with Psalm 3. Please stand. We continue with the gospel acclamation. Our gospel for this evening is taken from, gospel, from John uh, chapter 13. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. The Gospel of the Lord. 
Praise be to you, O Christ. We continue with our sermon hymn, hymn 469, Welcome, Happy Morning. Please be seated.
and the Lord Jesus Christ, my dear and treasured friend in Christ. Wouldn't it be great? Many years ago, there was a lady who showed up to my front door, and she brought along with her her little daughter, and that's the question that she asked me. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if every person in the U.S. took out the the list of the Ten Commandments and focused in on just one of those commandments. Not even all of them. Just one of those commandments. Pick one of the ten. And she said, wouldn't it be great if each of us picked one of those commandments and really, truly committed ourselves to keeping that commandment? She said, wouldn't and brought ourselves to them and, 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 and looked at even one of them and focused in on them, my word, the, the, this world, this nation would be better off, wouldn't it? But you know what? There's a question that you need to ask before you ask that question. And the question is this. How many of us can keep the Ten Commandments? You see, I'm, I'm kind of uh, leading you in, in a bad direction in the sense that when the lady came up to my um, front doorstep, I had already been brought up to speed. The lady belonged to uh, a religion that was not a Christian religion, and uh, she believed that you get to heaven by doing good stuff. And I had a professor at the seminary who gave us a heads up. He said, one of these days, someone is going to approach you either in a coffee shop or come up to your door, and they're going to say, If only, if only you would do these good things, then you can get into heaven. And then he said, when that day happens, you go ahead of time and you memorize if you can. If not, bring out your Bible and open it up to Romans chapter 3. And Paul in Romans chapter 3, nine times, so um, Professor Kriske put it this well, when he, he rings the bell with three triplets, Dong, 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 right? Nine times he says, there is no one good. No, not even one. Their mouths are open graves. They run to deceit. They run to decay. Again, no one good, not even one. And that really sets the stage properly, doesn't it? Before he asks the question, wouldn't it be great? You need to ask the other question. How many of us can actually keep the commandments? Not all of them, just even one of them. That's one of the the main issues that we're, we're looking at here in God's word this evening. Peter, in Acts chapter 10, has a vision. And in Acts chapter 10, we get to hear what the vision was all about. This is Acts chapter uh, chapter 10, I'm I'm starting at verse 9. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, he replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. So in these words here in Acts chapter 10, Uh, Jesus has risen from the dead, and it's only been weeks, it's months since this happened. It hasn't happened, um, you know, we're not looking ahead years or decades in the future, it's only been months. And the the brand new early Christian church, they're, they're wrestling with it. On the one hand, Jesus has risen from the dead, 
But on the other hand, there's all of these commands in the Bible. There was the, the, you know, hundreds and hundreds of commands in the Old Testament, and of course, at the, the cream of the crop, as it were, are the, the Ten Commandments. And there's this swirling around sort of question, what do we do with them? So Jesus rises from the dead. We know our sins are forgiven, but what do we do about all these commands? What do we do? And, and it makes it very difficult then, because if you're a Jewish person, how do you go out and you share the gospel if there are these boundaries in the way? You know, these borders, these laws of clean and unclean. For example, if you're a Jewish person, you are not allowed to touch or handle anything that a Gentile has touched. You're not allowed to go into the same house as a Gentile, as a non-Jew, because then you would become ceremonially unclean. Makes it challenging then, doesn't it, to do evangelism, doesn't it? And so Peter, along with others, are wrestling with this question. On the one hand, Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, the proof is there that our sins are forgiven. But on the other hand, what do we do with all these commands that are there in the Bible? So there's this vision. And in the vision, there's something like a sheet, like you know, a bed sheet that's dropped down from the sky. And on it, now, I, I, I didn't notice this before, but notice how the Lord is kind of sneaky. Um, Peter goes up on the rooftop to pray. And what are they doing below? They're preparing um, the meal. It's kind of like um, over at our church. Uh, the kitchen is right below where I'm preaching. And if they have a, a potluck, that smell oozes up above. Right? And I think the ladies do that deliberately, so I'll get into my sermon earlier. But nonetheless, um, there's that smell. The same thing is going on here. Peter is hungry as they are preparing the mood, the, the, the food, rather. And what happens then is there's this sheet that gets drop down from heaven, and on, on it, you know, on it are all these unclean animals. You know, the uh, pigs, for example, reptiles, um, types of unclean birds they're not allowed to eat. And they're on this sheet. And the Lord then says to Peter, Peter, get up, slaughter that, that um, pig, slaughter that reptile, and eat it. And Peter then says in response, not a chance, very strong way of saying no, no. And then the Lord responds by saying, do not treat as if it's corrupted that which I have cleansed. And this happens three times. And of course, then the, the, the vision from the Lord goes away. And Peter is left there wondering, and then very quickly then he puts it together. And the Lord in those words isn't just speaking about animals, far more to the point, he's speaking about people. Jesus has cleansed us. And the result of it then is there, there aren't these boundaries and borders that there used to be. And so what happens then is Peter then, as we're going to read, he goes to Cornelius' house, this Roman centurion, and, and he goes into the house. How challenging that must have been goes into the house. So Jesus has cleansed us. He has cleansed us from the commands. Commands that we could never keep. Again, to, to go back where we started, wouldn't it be great if you kept one of these commandments? Fine. But how many of us can actually keep them? None. So what does Jesus do? He cleanses us by keeping these commands in our place. So notice what he does. He takes the Ten Commandments then, and he keeps them in our place. He loves his Father perfectly in our place. He loves his neighbor perfectly in our place. It's the foundation of our faith. But it goes even further and farther than that, doesn't it? Because there are these hundreds of commands in the Old Testament, many of whom you, know, you probably don't even know about, but they're there. And what is Jesus? Holy Week is this treasured week for us 
where Jesus pays for our sins on the cross and he proves our sins are forgiven by rising from the dead. But if you appreciate Holy Week, then also then we also appreciate Jesus' first week of, on this earth as a human being. For he's born, and then there's this beautiful event. He's circumcised in the name. And that circumcision is a good thing because it lets us know that there are all these commands, hundreds and hundreds of them in the Old Testament, and Jesus keeps each of them, even the ones we don't even remember are there. Peter then, uh, he, after the vision, he does go and he visits this man by the name of Cornelius. Verse 24, the following day he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. So, Peter then goes to Cornelius, and he, he lets him know, hey, I'm here under your roof. Why? Because the Lord has let me know that Jesus has cleansed us from commands we could never keep. And then in a very interesting way, notice what saying we know we now know how true it is that God does not show favoritism and then he's saying I was showing favoritism and you should not show favoritism either I did it it was wrong and, and you should not follow in my footsteps again he's putting a, a command on them so notice that in a very fascinating way Jesus has cleansed us from our sins and then Jesus then cleanses us back up a second. Jesus cleanses us from commands we could never keep. There we go. And he also then, in a very interesting way, cleanses us for commands. Fascinating, right? So then we have to ask the question, what commands? What commands is it that the Lord places on us right here, right now in this New Testament um, area, in arena, in context? And and so there's the what question. What commands are binding on us as Christians? And what happens then is Jesus keeps all of these Old Testament ceremonial laws, and they're gone. They're gone. And, and no one's going to speak over them. Or to put it differently, uh, when you came to worship this evening, I did not see a whole lot of you standing in line uh, with an animal in hand or in tow behind you. And, and, and I wasn't waiting here sharp knife, putting an animal on the altar and slitting the throat and having the blood run down to the four corners. Right? Jesus kept these Old Testament ceremonial laws in our place. Now they're gone. And don't let anyone drag you back to them. Now, here's the more challenging part. Jesus then keeps not just these hundreds of ceremonial laws, Jesus also keeps the Ten Commandments in our place, and they're gone. Now, that should be the sort of thing, you know, where if you've just heard what I've said, uh, um, one of my professors used to say, it's good to change out hymnals sometimes, because the old hymnals, if they still have sharp edges, you can smite your pastor if he says things that are wrong, because the edges are still sharp. I've just gotten done saying that not only the Old Testament ceremonial laws are but also the Ten Commandments. Gone! Well, what, am I, what do I mean? Let me give you some examples. Um, in the, the numbering of, of the Ten Commandments, whether you're following Exodus 20 or, or Deuteronomy 5, um, toward the top, first or second commandment, there is the love of the Lord your God, right? On it, um, um, and then in that, then, is you shall not make graven images of your God. Right? Um, and throughout the Old Testament time, the Lord was against this. All of a sudden, then you get to the New Testament time, 
And very early, we see that they're making mosaics and images and statues and everything with pictures of Jesus on them. Well, why? Because Jesus keeps that command, and it's gone. Or to use all the beautiful examples that we have here at St. John, Jesus is staring at you here. Jesus is staring at you here. Here in our congregation here, you seemingly can't go around a corner without Jesus staring back at you. And that's wonderful. And what does it show? Jesus keeps that command. Raven images part. And then it's gone. Give you another example. The, um, uh, in catechism class a couple days ago, I asked the kids, um, what is the third commandment? And then I said, all right, let's say it all together. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And then I said, now what day of the week is, is the Sabbath? And one brave soul um, lifted um, his or her hand and said, Saturday. And I'm like, okay, Saturday. What day of the week do you usually worship on? Sunday. And I said, are you okay with that? How do you know that that's okay? And the child said, uh, um, well, we've been doing that forever, so it must be okay. Well, that's a good start, but we can say better, right? Again, um, this third commandment then is fulfilled, and it's gone. Let me give you one final example. Uh, there's the fourth commandment. Um, uh, um, again, the kids, I had them say, honor your father and mother that it may go well with you, that you may enjoy long life. On the earth. Um, in the Old Testament, there's actually a part two. Part two is, yeah, honor your father and mother that it may go well with you. And here's part two. It may go well with you in the land that you are about to go into and dispossess. The land of the Canaanites, Jebusites, Hivites, Amorites, and three or four other ites. Right? So I told the class, I said, uh, um, um, when you think of the fourth commandment, you have this burning desire to go and smite uh, a group of people with it and, and, and their last part of their, you know, their name. And the dystopian Winthropians and the feisty Fairfaxian kids, you know, they think about it for a second. They're like, well, there are the Gibbonites. I thought about that sometimes with them, right? Um, the, so what's the point, though? Uh, there's that part of the fourth commandment that's gone. Just gone. We need to recognize that gone. And it's vitally important um, for a couple reasons. Number one, there are groups of Christians who would see these paintings of Jesus here, this beautiful stained glass, and they would say, you're doing it wrong. Because you shall not have any carved out graven images of Jesus. Uh, or another example is when you send your kids off to university, um, or they have any education in, in our public school system, uh, don't be surprised if, like me, they get to the Bible as literature class. And the professor goes and says, you call yourselves Christians, but you are hypocritical. Because you keep part of the so-called fourth commandment, honor your father and mother, but you don't keep the other part about going over and exterminating other groups of peoples. Now we can even begin to see why this is important to talk about. So Jesus, to back up a tiny bit, Jesus keeps all these ceremonial laws, and they're gone. And Jesus then keeps the Old Testament Ten Commandments, and they're gone. And if you have questions about this, email me, you know, talk to me. We can talk about this further, right? Well, then you might be saying to yourself, wait a minute. My parents and my pastor had me memorize the Ten Commandments and Luther's explanation. What a waste! No, my dear friends, it was not. So here's why. Um, I just got done mentioning that Peter puts a burden of, of a commandment of love on, on, on uh, Cornelius and his family. And he has every right to do so. Because Jesus then, in, in a beautiful way, picks up these Ten Commandments. But not in the way that we might expect. Um, in, over in Gibbon, uh, you know... You have the, the, the blessing in a certain sense of having the same structure that you've had since, since day one. Um, but over in Gibbon, as, as you well know, at a certain part in, in 58, they tore down the church and they built a new one. And if you go and visit uh, Emmanuel and Gibbon there, over in the corner over here um, with the baptistry, there's Jesus the Good Shepherd stained glass. And um, no doubt, as they were tearing down that old white um, church, all the, the stuff on the outside, all the white siding, they're like, 
garbage, 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 right? But then they get to the, the, the stained glass good shepherd, and what do they conclude? Not garbage. This is beautiful. This is useful. So we're going to take this out of its context in the old church, out of its casing, out of its setting, and take it to the new church and, and give it a beautiful area so for age after age, generation after generation, people can see the Good Shepherd right there. It's the same Jesus, it's the same stained glass, but in a different setting, in a different context. And that's what Jesus does with the Ten Commandments. He doesn't go to the Old Testament and lock, stock, and barrel, drag them into the new. No, he keeps them and then they're gone. But he takes the teachings of them, the foundation of them, and then he builds them up anew. Okay, so Christ has cleansed us from commands, Christ has cleansed us for commands, and we've talked about the what. Let's talk about the why for, for just a second. Why would Jesus then, um, if he's kept all of these commands in our place, why would he refurbish them? Why would he uh, redo them for us in the New Testament? Uh, reason number one, I don't know about you, but I have a sinful nature. And my sinful nature, until the moment I die, will always love myself above everybody else. So these Ten Commandments then, again, a refurbished, modified version, are here for us to show us our sins like looking into a mirror. The other reason then is as a guide to give us a, a way to thank our Lord and give us true wisdom by looking back in the past and seeing how they approached the same problems. So the what, and then now we talked about the why, and finally then, the how. And that's where we get to these words. So again, notice the, the, the burden, the command that, he's, um, uh, that Peter is looking at. God does not show favoritism. And neither should you. And that applies in a big and broad way. Uh, um, all of us who are baptized into Christ are children of God. And the result of it then is whether you're talking about male or female, young or old, we're all children of God. The detail that Peter brings up here in these words is one of favoritism, though, and especially favoritism uh, as Paul speaks about nations. When I think about that, I think of my own uh, family history. On my dad's side, they were originally from Germany, and then they traveled to Russia because they were dirt poor farmers. Um, and for a generation or two, it worked out well there. They were in, in Russia teaching the Russians how to farm. And then they, um, favoritism was shown against them. And they left. And when they left, they left lock, stock, and barrel, entire villages leaving and going to the U.S. And they were treated horribly there in Russia. And then you would think they're coming to this land of opportunity here in the United States. And sadly, there was favoritism that was shown against them when they got here. They didn't dress like us Americans, wearing long Russian clothing. They didn't speak like us Americans. They were speaking German as they came off the boat. And they were poor. And there were people that said, oh, look at them. Those immigrants, they come. They don't speak our language. They take our jobs. Um, are they coming? And that statement right there, I saw in recent months, how shocking that statement is. Because that favoritism has always been around. And today the context of that is not for people 150 years ago coming from Russia speaking German, but instead it's, it's people coming to our own community. The people who don't speak the language that we do. They don't look like we do. And there is this temptation to look at them and say, why don't they speak our language? As if speaking English is so easy to pick up. Well, why don't they dress like we do? They're coming here and they're taking our jobs. And it makes us ask the question, the same one that Peter asked himself, am I showing favoritism? 
And notice then we have this amazing example from Peter. What I love about Peter, whatever he did, he, he did 100%, right? He doesn't get the fact that since Jesus rose from the dead, we're all cleansed from commands we could never keep. He doesn't get it. So then the Lord reveals that to him, and what does he do? He's going around to everybody saying, I messed up. I didn't get it. You know, I didn't get it at all. I was showing favoritism, and, and Jesus has revealed this to me. I repent. I am forgiven, and I am sharing this forgiveness um, uh, to you. And I'm not just sharing it. I'm showing it to you by coming into your house, shaking your hand, eating your food in the same, you know, bowl that you're eating it from. What an amazing example to follow. To know that there are times that, as Jesus says, love one another. And one of the ways we can see that we've failed is there are times that we've been tempted and even given in to favoritism. That, along with all the other commands that we could not keep, is forgiven and fulfilled. Christ has cleansed us. Christ has cleansed us from commands we could never keep. And Christ has cleansed us for commands. We continue this evening by speaking together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue, oh, please be seated. We continue by gathering our offering and moving into our Bible study.
What does being mature look like? Speaking the truth in love. That's what maturity looks like. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> okay, so again, so on the first um, slide, uh, oh, whoa, whoa, let me go back one slide, please. Go back one slide. Um, help me answer the question uh, What actions do Christians take um, when it comes to communicating? What actions do Christians take? when it comes to, to communicating with each other. I helped you out by underlining it. We speak, right? We put words together, okay? Speak the truth, but notice then there's a contact. Speak the truth in love, okay? Thank you. Um, then, next slide. Um, if your brother sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen uh, to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. The, the very famous words in, in um, uh, Matthew chapter 18 that you've probably heard before. If, um, so the context is this. If you have done something wrong against me, there's this urgency for me to go and speak to you. Why? Because I want you to be forgiven. There's this urgency. Forgiveness is at stake. Salvation is at stake. So there's, there's this urgency. If you have sinned against me, you may not even know it. You know, you might have been making fun of my pillow pet or, or, or my kids or my football team. I don't follow football. You've noticed that by now. But you might make fun of that. And I, you know, I might be, um, you know, I might not even, even notice. You might have done something wrong against me. And, uh, um, and uh, you know, so I, I go to you and I show you your sin. Okay? Um, next slide. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar first. Go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. No, oh, now this is where the setting changes. Um, in Matthew 18, it's if you sin against me, there's this urgency. I need to go to you. But now notice here it's the opposite. Instead of you sinning against me, if I have sinned against you, notice then the urgency. You drop that gift right there. Oh, by the way, the gift, the idea here with a gift is it's a fellowship offering. It's this, um, I have been forgiven and now I'm at peace with God above and my neighbor. Well, if, if that's not true, if I've sinned against my neighbor and haven't been reconciled, you drop that gift right there and you go and be reconciled to your neighbor because you messed up. So again, um, um, notice there's this urgency to go and speak, right? Okay, next slide. When it comes to communication, what action are we as Christians supposed to do? Next slide. Do I have, is, or is that like a real question? Okay, summary, summary. That's a real question. Thank you. Um, help me out. Um, when, when there are uh, uh, challenges um, uh, um, as, as Christians, oh, what challenges arise if we as Christians, oh yeah, to, to back up one slide, um, when it comes to, to communication, what action are we as Christians supposed to do? Help me fill in the blank. Speak. All right, you're with me. All right, next slide. On the other hand, what challenges arise if we as Christians do not speak to each other? Can you help me fill in the blank? What are some of the things that might happen if we don't speak? Yeah. Yeah, misunderstanding. Um, excellent, uh, Mr. Risto. At the end of the book of Hebrews, it says, um, make sure that no root of bitterness rises up between you. Oh. Um, Satan loves that when Christians don't speak to each other. And then what happens then is this bitterness, can, it goes from bad to worse because um, our, our thoughts just spin out of control and we, and we think the, um, some, some pretty bad thoughts. Okay, a good example. Um, any others? What challenges arise if we as Christians do not speak to each other? You might not know there's a problem. Yeah, you might not even know. You might be blindly doing the same dumb, stupid thing again and again just because you don't know. You just don't know. 
And then it makes the matter even worse because no one in love is going gonna, is gonna to go and speak to you. Right? A good example. Yeah. Any other examples? Okay, next slide. Um, uh, uh, um, so one of the other examples here is from 2 Corinthians. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and open wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. Interesting, isn't it? Um, so Paul, this is now the second letter that Paul has written to Corinth. Corinth is an amazing book. Um, um, uh, it's very useful for us in the New Testament because seemingly every mistake you could make in a congregation, the Corinthians made it. So it's useful to have a look at it. Now again, I, I'm not saying that as if we have things figured out, but we have our sins too. Um, but they made a lot of mistakes, in this, and, and one of them is, is this. Paul is reaching out to them. His heart is, is, is exposed to them as he's trying to speak to them. And what's their response to him? How, what might you guess by the, the words that Paul is saying? Here? He's reaching out to them, but what do you think they're doing to him? Are they responding? No. And, and notice then um, uh, where that puts Paul. Um, you know, he says, um, uh, uh, we have opened wide our hearts um, to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. There's this closeness and affection that should be there among Christians, but when there is silence, when there should be speaking, that's what happens. It's the beginning of the root of bitterness, to use those words from, from Hebrews. Um, uh, and by the way, um, the world that we're living in is make the, making this even worse. Um, I learned a new word, uh, ghosting. Ghosting? Have you, have you guys heard this word before? You know, so ghosting is evidently, it's um, uh, uh, ghosting, it makes it, it, when you have modern technology, cell phones, texting, and a whole bunch of stuff like that, um, it's easy to just break off communications with someone and pretend they didn't exist. You just delete the cell phone number, um, and you, you um, unfollow them or whatever on Facebook, and you, and, you, and you block them from Twitter. And then, as far as your view goes, they don't exist anymore. They can't access you. You can't access them. Okay? This silencing that happens. Um, uh, and Paul here, he's dealing with it because they're, they're ghosting him. And he's reaching out to them. Okay, so that's, um, you guys made an amazing list. I'm adding that to the list. Um, uh, 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 if we don't speak, um, then this is what happens. This, this closeness, this, this affection gets robbed from us. Okay, next slide. Okay, what challenges arise when you try to communicate by giving someone the silent treatment? Bitterness? Um, ignorance, as, as uh, Ms. Endorf said, um, you know, you, you, you have the scenario where you might not even know that you're doing the thing, and, and it just continues. Um, any other answers there that might happen? It builds walls between you and the communication gets cut off. Yeah, it builds the walls. The communication is cut off. Um, it goes from bad to worse. Okay, good, good. Okay, next slide. What attitude do we hold in our hearts when we do not know all the details? Okay, raise your hand if you're omniscient. Raise your hand if you know all, everything. You know. <laughs> Randy. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah. Um, um, we're not. Um, we're not omniscient, and there are going to be a lot of times in your life when you just don't know. Well, what do you do in the not knowingness? What do you do when you don't know? Okay. Next slide. Um, so we teach our kids this: the eighth commandment: "You shall not give false testimony about against your neighbor." What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, or give him a bad name but defend him, speak well of him. And here's where it gets interesting. And take his words and actions in the kindest possible way. Interesting. So Luther in the large catechism, he goes into a lot of detail there. But when in doubt, okay, someone does something, or rather doesn't do something, but you don't know. When in doubt, do you conclude the worst or do you conclude the best? Huh? Oh, this, I thought this would, would be an easy question. Take pe people's words and actions in the worst possible way. No, take them in the kindest possible way, the best way. 
Oh yeah, let me, let me give you an example then. Next slide. Help me fill in the blank. Um, when we do not have all the details or data, we take people's words and actions, can you help me say it together, in the kindest possible way. Okay, next slide. Give me an example. Help me apply this truth. Bob is a truck driver. When Bob is in town, he makes it to the church about once or twice a month. When he is away, he is not in church. Um, he watches the services online when he can and listens to the podcasts of the Bible studies. Okay, next slide. Likewise, if Bob were not help happy with someone in the congregation, how would showing his approval by giving people the silent treatment backfire on him? Okay, so um, when Bob is in town, he's in church. When Bob is not in town, he's on the road, it should not surprise us that he's not in church. And nobody knows his schedule besides Bob. So Bob goes along and he says, I, um, I don't like what that person did in the church, so I'm going to not talk to that person in church. And then they're going to get the clear communication that I'm not happy with them because I'm, I'm silencing them. How, how does that really not gel together with just common sense? Bob has gone a lot. Now when Bob is gone, we put, uh, take, take Bob's words and actions in the kindest possible way. Bob is gone, and what are we going to conclude? Kindest possible way? Bob is on the road, he'll come back. Right? Are you with me so far? Okay. Um, next slide. Um, considering the passage from 2 Corinthians, how also, not just is it, is it against common sense, it's also unloving. Uh, to give someone the silent treatment. And again, the example there from Paul, I'm pouring out my heart to you. I'm communicating all over the place. And then you're, you're, you're withholding your heart from me. You're not communicating. It's not just against common sense. It's also unloving. Okay, next slide. Summary. Healthy communication is, remember the first three passages? All right, you're with me. All right, good. Um, Okay, next, next point, speaking, excellent. Next um, thing then, unhealthy communication, um, communicating is, can you give me some examples? Silence, okay, yeah. Okay, what did I say for an answer? Separating, much the same, okay, silence. Um, next slide. All right, help, help me uh, apply this truth in the near future. Hans Dorfenheimer is your new pastor. Great name, isn't it? Um, new, brand new pastor, okay, straight out of the seminary. All right, um, Hans Dorfenheimer. Uh, I'm, um, he is your brand new out of the seminary. He's excited to be your pastor, but he doesn't have 20 or 40 years of experience yet. He makes mistakes. And there are many areas where he actually isn't wrong. What he's doing is just new. Let's look at some examples. Example one. Sorry. You didn't get that far? Okay. No, 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 that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. We will pick it up next week. Oh, there, we're fine, we're fine then. We'll, we'll, um, we'll pick it up next week with some examples. It's like the old um, uh, Batman um, show. You guys remember the, the black and white Batman show? They had all these cliffhangers. And it always made me, um, as a kid, I would watch it. And then at the end of like one of the episodes, there'd be this massive boulder, like you know, six feet diameter on top of Batman. And then it ends by saying, and what will happen to the, you know, to the, to the bat? What will happen to Batman? And the beginning of the next episode, the six-foot diameter boulder is about a foot in diameter. And then at the very beginning of, of the episode, he just goes, bloop, and then he starts doing his, his Batman thing. And you're like, wait a minute. But so we're, we're going to leave with, with a cliffhanger tonight. Um, we're going to walk through a couple of examples. Um, you got a brand new pastor, Hans Dorfenheimer. What are we going to do with, with that guy? How are we going to treat him? How are we going to speak the truth in love? We're going to talk about that next week. Okay. Um, so uh, let's continue then with our liturgy. <clears throat> okay. Please stand. We'll continue with our prayers.
we have a, a handful of prayer requests. Uh, there's a prayer of thanks for um, saving people from bodily harm in the Fairfax area during the recent storm, uh, indeed. Um, a prayer of thanks uh, for our recent graduate from MLC um, and Allison Grunke, who received a call to Redding, California. Um, for uh, early childhood, and a prayer for, uh, indeed, uh, for a SEM grad for us to serve as our pastor here at St. John and Emmanuel. We pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, ever since the fall into sin, it's not just people that have been affected and infected by sin, but also creation. There are earthquakes, there are famines, there are floods, there are tornadoes, and there are storms. We thank you, O Lord, for extending your saving hand uh, to the farms, to the homes, to the tractors, to the people, especially in the area. Uh, for so often we see what damage is done, and we don't stop to consider what damage could have been done and was avoided by your angels. So we praise and thank you for this. And we ask with the damage that was done, that in your own good time, you would make it good and right. We also pray, uh, thank you, O oh Lord, to our graduates um, who are being sent out now as teachers, and also then for Allison. Be with them as they travel, some of them traveling many states away, to do your work and do your will. Give them, O oh Lord, a home away from home. When they are away from family members and parents and grandparents, Give them, all of those adopted grandparents and parents and friends and brothers and sisters in Christ in their new congregation, give them energy, give them wisdom, give them a humble heart to serve you all the days in all the states and places that you call them. And finally, O oh Lord, for our own sake, we pray that you would give us a graduate from our seminary to serve as our pastor. It's going to be close to two years now, and we ask that you look down on mercy and he give us a pastor, not because we have asked for it or deserved it, but purely out of your grace. For as we walked through this evening, you are the good and gracious shepherd who ascended into heaven, and you gave gifts to your church, preacher teachers, who would go and share your word with you, uh, with, uh, share your word with us. Give to us a shepherd who would shepherd your sheep. We pray this in your name. Amen. And we continue with a prayer. <laughs> <coughs> you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We conclude with our final hymn, hymn 699, Take the World But Give Me Jesus. Take the world, but, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name. But his love abides forever. Through eternal years the same. Oh, the height and depth of mercy, oh, the length and breadth of love, oh, the fullness of redemption, 
Pledge of endless life above. Take the world, but give me Jesus, sweetest comfort of my soul. With the Savior watching o'er me, I can sing through thunder's roll. Oh, the height and depth of mercy, oh, the length and breadth of love, oh, the fullness of redemption, pledge of endless life above. Take the world, but give me Jesus. In his cross my trust shall be, till with clearer, brighter vision, Face to face, my Lord, I see. Oh, the height and depth of mercy. Oh, the length and breadth of love. Oh, the fullness of redemption. Pledge of endless life above. Good morning, or uh, evening, evening, good evening. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. Um, uh, the only announcement I, um, that I have to bring to your attention is just simply uh, that our, our council met a couple days ago, um, and for the, the rest of this month, we'll be having our worship on Sunday nights, same time, same place. Um, so Sunday nights at six, but starting in June for that month, we're gonna be switching to Saturday night at five. So I wanna give you a heads up about that. That's coming up. Um, also then, uh, as I mentioned last week, uh, you're, you're calling for a pastor and it's kinda neat. Normally you just get maybe a notice in the mail or a letter. Uh, when it comes to getting a graduate, there's oh, you know, a little bit more excitement because you can watch a video on, uh, online. Um, of course, it's, it's, I think it's on a Thursday morning, that 26th, so you might be working, but if you're not, um, it's kind of neat to see it. It's, it's a, a very beautiful and unique um, event to see, and uh, we're all keeping that in our prayers. Um, most likely, his name is not going to be Hans Dorf, uh, Dorfenheimer, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Um, any announcements I'm, I'm, I'm missing? Oh, let's watch the Wells Connection. All right, thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Years ago, Christian congregations automatically had a good reputation in their community. Today, we have to earn it. The word for that process is pre-evangelism, and it's increasingly important, especially for our mission congregations, as they build connections in new communities. As with any new mission start, the leadership at In-Town Lutheran Church in Atlanta looks for ways to reach out in our Savior's name to the surrounding community. But the usual canvassing and mailers won't connect with a population that's increasingly wary of Christians. Leaders here realized the first step is to earn the trust of their neighbors. It's very important for churches to not only have the gospel message of Jesus to tell people if they come to hear it, but to also show what the gospel is to people. One way members of In Town demonstrate they care is through an event called the Christmas Store. People who don't have the resources to buy Christmas presents for their families can come to the church and choose some modest gifts at no charge. It's very hopeful and I think that giving kids and like, you know, adults the chance to like feel really hopeful during the season is important. 
Not only does this event give hope to people in need, but it also gives members a meaningful opportunity to serve others face to face, to make a difference in the community. Because building authentic relationships is a key step to building a Christian church. This wasn't like, oh, I have to go help at church. It was like, oh, I'm going to go hang out at church. You know, it's just a very different um, scenario when you really feel like you have true friendships. When I came here and I see that everyone is so connected as a family, they care for you, they care for your kids, it's just, it just made me want to be a part of it. How can I not? I could have been anywhere today, but I wanted to be here because it's the love that brought me here, and I love it. But how does a small mission congregation like InTown manage to put on big events with limited resources? The answer is by working in tandem with local nonprofit organizations. For example, the Christmas store was organized by a group called the Atlanta Leadership Club. The congregation's contribution was to provide space and volunteers, with the Leadership Club doing the rest. So rather than reinvent the wheel and do something that really isn't our wheelhouse as a church, I mean, we're here to preach the gospel. By working with somebody that knows how to do these things well, we're able to do it in a positive way, and we're also able to connect people to the gospel faster. The volunteers are a mix of church members along with unchurched people who are looking for opportunities to help others. Often, it's these non-member volunteers who see Christian love flowing from the members, and they become members too. We're gonna to have a number of volunteers at our event this year who have not been to our church for worship, and this is going to be the first interaction they have with the Intown Lutheran Church is a service opportunity. This approach has proven to be such a blessing that the director of Wells Christian Aid and Relief, Reverend Daniel Sims, is visiting today part of an effort to expand this idea across our Synod. So we're here today because we are really interested in encouraging compassion ministry in our Synod. We're also providing congregations basically a template of how they might do this. We're looking for compassion ministry that's active, that gets the members of the congregation uh, in touch with the people of their community, involved in their community, Congregations have always been built around relationships, our relationship with Christ and each other. Today, we have to work a little harder to gain trust. And the way we do that is to show the love of Jesus. Partnering with a local nonprofit can be a smart way for congregations to do pre-evangelism in the community. To encourage that effort, Wells Christian Aid and Relief has created the Community Care and Compassion Matching Grant Program, which offers matching grants to churches engaged in compassion ministry. Those are all of our, oh, oh, oh Mr. Risto. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Uh, we're meeting tomorrow night for a school board meeting. Um, it's, it's proving difficult to replace Ms. Endorf. Um, I've been thinking of contracting with like an Android robot company to get, to get a robot, but we might be opening up a, a, a can of worms having two Ms. Endorfs running around would be, that's more than the world could probably take. <laughs> so uh, keep our, our school in your prayers too, because there are 140 vacancies um, for teachers and that means we're, it's just going to be some difficult years ahead and we, we pray for the Lord of the harvest. Yeah. Um, may the Lord bless you richly. Christ has cleansed us from commands we could never keep and Christ cleanses us for commands to keep. Amen.